Amen. Indescribably worthy. That is our Lord. Let's take our Bibles today and open them to the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're going to be in verses 37 through 47 today. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 47. This comes at the conclusion of the sermon that the Apostle Peter preached on the day of Pentecost to the Jews from around the world that had gathered into Jerusalem. And God just moved among them in a, among them in a mighty way through this sermon to turn their hearts to Christ Jesus. And we see here at the end what happens at the end of that sermon and the result that came from it. When they heard this, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what must we do? Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus the Messiah, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. And with many other words he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles, now all the believers were together and had everything in common, so they sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as anyone had need. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day... The Lord added to them those who were being saved. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today needing to hear from you. We can do nothing on our own, Lord. It's only through you that we can do anything. So we pray that you would work upon our hearts and our minds now to change us and transform us into that which you desire. Help us to know you through your word and Lord change us that we would obey it with all that we are. And I pray, Father, from the bottom of my heart that each and every one of us here today would be blessed through the apostles teaching your word. And that if there's any heart here, Lord, that needs today to begin a relationship with you, to know you and the hope that comes from having you in their lives, I pray that you would open their hearts to the gospel, give them grace to believe it, and save them this day, Lord. And Father, for we, your church, prepare us for what we will hear, and the challenging nature of it, and help us to be ready to change where you would have us to change, continue where you would have us to continue, and to be what you, God, have made us to be. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. We are continuing today in our sermon series called Simple Church. We're judging ourselves here by what we see the earliest church doing, and we're comparing ourselves to see if we're doing the same thing or if we need to begin to do it. We see the, the fruit that comes from this early church, and this is the church that we want to be. The Apostle Peter here had given this message. The Bible tells us here 3,000 people came to Christ through the preaching of the gospel. And when they come together, the Bible says that here's what they did. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That was number one. They got with God in his word, and a fellowship came together through it. That's why we see also specified here that after devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, they also devoted themselves to the fellowship now here's the thing about fellowship we've got a we've got a little problem we need to deal with here right on 
When we think of fellowship, let's just be honest, we think of something we do in what we call the fellowship hall, which is really just the church basement. <laughs> and as we are gathered in the fellowship hall, we think we're fellowshipping with what we call a fellowship meal, which is really just a lunch like you would have any other place, except it's in the basement that we call the fellowship hall. So this is our concept of fellowship. We get together to eat, and don't get me wrong, but it is a Baptist tent, okay? Uh, it's, it's a cardinal of our faith that we must eat together numerous times through the year, only in the fellowship hall, but having that fellowship meal. That's our concept of fellowship. What I think you'll see today, biblically, however, is that fellowship is something much, much deeper and much, much richer and much more satisfying to our souls. Biblical fellowship is the overflowing of God's life in us to one another. It's showing His care and concern and joy to us through each other. It's the uniting of all of us in the great desire of making Jesus known in his church and in his world. Now, there's a whole lot to unravel here, so let's start to break this down piece by piece. Pray that Jesus would make us to be a people of true fellowship. We'll begin today by looking first at the basis of our fellowship. Friends, you understand that any group on earth has fellowship together because they share something in common. A military veteran will have fellowship with another military veteran because they understand what boot camp is, they understand what military life is, sometimes they understand what war is. So they have this common shared experience. Alcoholics or drug addicts that are recovery from their addictions, have fellowship with one another because they know what it is to be enslaved to the booze or enslaved to the substance. And they know what it is not only to be enslaved but to also be freed. So they come together and they have this fellowship. So how does the church have fellowship? Have you ever thought about that? I won't get too far deviated here, but have you ever thought about how incredibly wild it is that we here in this room have fellowship together one with another? I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm looking at a lot of people here, and if it wasn't for the fact that we share Christ and we share a family of faith together, I don't know that we would be fellowshipping together. That's how powerful this is. Every Every life is a different life. All of us come from different situations. All of us come from similar or, or different backgrounds. But the one thing we have in common is Jesus Christ. Amen. We understand what it is to be a sinner saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. All of us here have been covered in his blood. We believe we've been covered in his blood. We receive his spirit. We are united together by him. That's how the church has fellowship together. It's all through Jesus. Listen to how John describes this in 1 John 1, 3. He says, what we have seen and heard, that's through the life of Christ, we also declare to you so that you may have fellowship along with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. The fellowship we have through God is the fellowship we have with one another. This verse reveals to us that our fellowship is rooted in our experience, our common experience with God. And here's what I mean by that statement. All of us who are Christians have been to the same boot camp, if you will. All of us have fought the same war. All of us have had the same addictions of sin. We have all been freed from them in the same way. And what way is that? It is the way of the cross of Christ Jesus. It's on the cross that Jesus suffered 
in my place and in yours, taking the guilt of my sin upon himself and your sin upon himself and taking it all until everything God had against you was fully poured out upon him. That's why the cross is so horrific. That's why there is a bloody pulp of a man hanging on that cross. Because that's what the wrath of God against you and I looks like. If you ever wonder what life is like apart from God, look to the cross of Jesus. That's where you'll find it. That's where you'll see it. That's nothing, nothing but the wrath of God against us. But Jesus took all of that. He took all of it on himself and he took it into his death. And he was buried. And on the third day he rose again. And he rose into new life. And that life is the life that comes to you and I. As people whose wrath, the wrath God had against us, has been dealt with in Jesus Christ that we might have his life and share that life one with another. The Bible says, I've been crucified with Christ, and yet I live, not I, but Christ who lives within me. Isn't it glorious that we all share that together? Each and every one of us, not only in this room, but across the entire globe, all of us that have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ share that. We share Him. It's by the grace of God Almighty that we stand forgiven and we stand together and we stand before his throne. Out of the many, God has made us one in Jesus Christ, his body, his church. That's why these believers were so devoted to fellowship. They knew in the most powerful of ways that they had all, all of them had been washed in Christ's blood and forgiven, been forgiven of all their sins. I mean, you got to remember, these are the, pe the people that Peter told not once, but twice, you crucified Jesus. And he could preach the same thing to you and me. We crucified Jesus. But in the abundant grace of God, it's that same Jesus that saves us and unites us as one in him and through him one to another. That's why they're able to sing. God is faithful. By him you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's the same for us here today. Friend, you, you don't have to do it because it might be awkward to your neighbor. But imagine for a moment you look to your left and you look to your right and you turn around and look behind you and you look in front of you. I, I want you to see here, friend, that whatever genetic family you have here, that's great but it pales in comparison to the spiritual family you have here. Right. We are the blood-bought family of Christ. All different, different professions, different personalities, but God has made us one, a community of faith, fellowship of faith, a family of faith by uniting us to himself. Don't ever underestimate that reality. And don't ever, don't ever put anything ahead of it. Friends, the painful thing, when we see Christians divide over things that are non-essential, like the color of the carpet, again, something Jesus didn't even command us to have. <laughs> the churches have literally split over such things as this. What happened there? What happened was either they weren't in Christ or they really undervalued what it meant to be bound in the yoke of Christ Jesus. That's us. Don't let anything come between that. God has really and truly made us one in him. And knowing here the basis of our fellowship, we're able to see secondly here the blessing of our fellowship. Since our fellowship with each other comes through the overflowing of God's life in us, we can expect to be blessed and strengthened in many ways through our fellowship. In our scripture, we see this overflow occur in the early family of faith in many ways. They took the Lord's Supper. 
together. They prayed together. This is all coming out of the passage I read to you. They shared all things in common. They provided for those in need. They worshiped together. They shared meals daily together. They were together. And the bounty of God's presence poured forth from their lives to one another to bless and encourage and lead them on mission for him. Christ is the center of their unity, you see. He is the source of their expression, faith, and fellowship. They were truly a blessed family of God. And I think that we can make the case here that one of the greatest blessings of Christian fellowship is the blessing of care. The blessing of care. Before I say another word, I want to commend you. Now, don't know if I get the big head. We've only got double doors to get out of here at the end. But I want to commend you that I, I often see a great deal of care one for another in our fellowship. And that's, that's an awesome thing. That's all from Christ. And I want to commend you for that. But I want to try to explain here more directly how this works and reaches us one to another. The other day, a, uh, a brother called and uh, I want to know how I was in. Yes. And uh, he said, I'll be in a little later. If it's okay, I'll stop in. Great. Uh, which, just in full disclosure, as a pastor, you never know where that's going to go. Uh, when somebody calls up and says, hey, can we meet tomorrow? That could be, I've got an outstanding blessing for you, pastor, or you're going to see that the sheep have teeth and often bite. You don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> but my, my brother came in, and uh, he sits down, and, and he says, uh, he says, I, I just wanted to stop in and uh, see. I'm, I'm glad you asked that, brother. And he said, yeah, you know, uh, he, he had seen some things happen. He had heard some things happen. And he said, I, I just want to make sure that, you know, you and Jennifer and your family are okay. So we talked about that. Now, some people would say, well, that's just one guy kind of checking in on you, which that's true. But in the terms of Christian fellowship, what happened was that was God's concern for me coming through that brother. Does that make sense? That's what happened. So we talked and at the end of it, he had uh, some questions about some things and wondered if I had any uh, sermons or anything about that, which I did. So. God's concern for him was then answered by God's gifting to me. So I, I gave him those materials. And that's how this works. When we see these things happening, it is God's concern for us. It's God's care working through us. And you might be saying, well, is it really my care? Of course it is. You wouldn't have that care if it wasn't for God working in your heart. So it really it truly is yours, but it all comes from him. He gets the glory for it, you see. That's the blessing of care. Friends, eating chicken, which all Baptists must do. <laughs> I, I think I've, I've experienced one meal here where there was no chicken. And I got to tell you, it hurt my heart <laughs> to have to endure that because I really felt like something was bad wrong here. Uh, I mean, ham, seriously? What, what? I don't know. But, uh, I mean, you had chicken with ham, but ham alone? We needed to repent. We probably spilled it. Let's just take it. No, just but, eating chicken's great. There we go. That's a bad just right there. It's great, and it's good to do, but it is a prelude to fellowship, you see. It's not just eating with each other. It's sharing God with each other. That's fellowship. It reveals to us God's deep and immense care for us through one another. God has designed us and saved us to need each other, my friends. Yes. And the blessings of care that come to us through our fellowship are the workings of God to build our faith and soften our hearts that the overflow of his care and his joy with flow to one another. Now, we also see here that a blessing of fellowship is the blessing of corporate worship. It is written of the early church that every day 
not just Sunday, every day, they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex. They met there because that's where Jews met. When Jews were going to seek and worship Christ, that's where they met. So these Jews were like, we found God. We need to go to the place where we always worship together. So they did. And I'm sure it goes without saying, but if we are to know biblical Christian fellowship, we actually have to be together. There's no other way for it to really happen. You can't be in fellowship and be a lone ranger. Even he had Tonto, right? We need to be together worshiping, praying together, sharing together, learning together. We need to be together in reaching this world for him as well. You know, I, I spoke with a lady recently. She told me a heartbreaking story. She said, I I don't understand why my church family, and it's not this one, so don't be looking around. But she said, I, I don't understand why my church family don't acknowledge me in public. They acknowledge me in the sanctuary, but they don't acknowledge me in public. And I told her, I said, well, I don't know the reasons why that's happening, but one thing I know for sure is that that is not the will of Christ for us. The will of Christ isn't just that we have this time together where we slide in and out of the pews on Sunday. This is a time together to lead us through the rest of the week on mission and in fellowship with one another. We, we can't be devoted to the head of the church, which is Christ, and ignore his body. He is saved by his blood. Men, try it out today. Go home and let your wife know that you really think her head is beautiful, but her body, man, see how that goes. Same way with us here. We can't ignore the body from which all parts fit together from. Are me together. That's of God. We're stirred to love by them. We're stirred to good works by them. And we're prepared to live in light of Christ's second coming through them. In short, we fellowship with Him and each other in these meetings. And not only here, of course, but definitely here. And God shows us His seriousness about it. When he gives these next words that immediately follow what I just told you. Listen. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Does anybody have any question about God's seriousness with this? He has just said that connected to Christ is the doing of love and the doing of good works and the meeting together with one another. And he then says, if anyone ignores this, if anyone sort of habitually gets out of our meetings, then you need to know this. Once you know this truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. You can't, you can't have the Christian life and Christian fellowship on your terms. We must have it on Christ's terms. That's why it's so critical that we be together in a spiritually deep and rich way to fellowship and to share God one to another. And I know, I know folks, yeah, I know, I've heard it all before. I know somebody else, and they'll think it's so very clever, they'll say, well, you don't have to go to church to be saved. 
Congratulations. Not a soul here has ever said that. Nobody here has ever said that. But what God just said was, the same person will be with his people. So that's where we check ourselves. That's where we check ourselves. If we're saved on Christ's terms, then we are the church and we will be with the church. Now, you can come to a meeting and not be saved. Maybe some of you here are today and we are glad you're here. This is exactly where you need to be. We're glad you're here. But the clear teaching of the Bible is that saved people will be in fellowship with God in his people. And that not through begrudging obedience. It's not like, oh yes, it's Sunday. I know I got to go to church. Just stay home. Just stay home. God doesn't need that type of offering. And he's not going to receive it anyway. So don't even try that. He wants it from the heart for us to be together. This leads us to look thirdly at the burdens on our fellowship. Now, to this point, we have found that biblical fellowship is the overflowing of God's life in us to one another. It shows us his care and his concern and joy to us. It's the uniting of us all in his life that we would share it with each other and the world. Now, such a great prospect put before us through fellowship with him and each other. What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly burden us? Let me propose a few burdens here that can quench our fellowship. See here that fellowship can't be programmed. It can't be programmed. In other words, there's nothing we can do to make fellowship happen. It has to come through the free expression of God's grace in us through the Holy Spirit. This means you're not going to find it in committee meetings. You're not going to find it in doing endless churchy type thing. It's not going to be there just because of that. It can be there from the heart, but it's not going to be there just because we're doing it. Fellowship won't be found because of what we do. Fellowship will be found because we are being who Christ has made us to be. We focus on be first, then do. You'll never get to be by focusing on do. One pastor has observed that the church often makes the mistake, and the early church did as well, of seeing God move among them in great ways, just doing awesome things. And as God is doing all these awesome things, people all of a sudden decide, hey, we need to organize this and get it together. And they organize it to focus on doing it. And by their organization, they quench the spirit, and it all ends. Just like it did in the early church, which you see later on in the New Testament. <laughs> Friends, we don't want to have it backwards. We fellowship by being. We do because of who we are. But you'll never be who you need to be in Christ just by doing. So let me ask you the question. Do you think the way we operate, do you think the way we govern ourselves, I'm not talking democratically. That's not going to change ever. But by what we actually do, how we program, do you think that helps our fellowship or do you think it's a means of hurting our fellowship? That's a big question with really big implications. You know, a few weeks back I was at an event. I was surrounded by people that attended a now shut down church. And they're all talking there, and I'm listening, and I'm, I'm just intrigued by the conversation. They're going on and on and on about how great and loving and everything was in this church family. And I'm hearing this, and I'm like, okay, so what went wrong? You know, is there something I need to know from that fellowship 
with my fellowship because I don't want to see that happen. So I just asked them out of the blue. And I, I think they all understood. I wasn't asking it sarcastically. I just asked them, hey, uh, if, if the ministry there was, was so great and you all were so filled with love one for another, then why did you shut down? Everybody went quiet, except for one woman directly across from me. She looked me in the eye and she said, we didn't have enough governance. I was astonished. That is not the answer I was expecting. I thought to myself, that's as honest as an answer as I could ever have hoped for. And I really thought about it. And I thought, you know, the Bible tells us that we, we have to do all things in decency and order, right? It, it does, if you didn't know that. It does say that. But we have to do all things in decency and order. And I'm, I'm looking at, at that church family, and I'm hearing from them, and they say, yeah, we, we basically had to shut down because we didn't have enough governance. And I'm looking at my church family, and I'm wondering if too little killed them, is too much going to kill us? And by kill, I mean quench the spirit. Churches continue for years when they're dead. Churches are amazingly resilient. And though I don't think we're dead, but I'm just saying just because we're going and keeping the lights on and meeting every Sunday, that doesn't mean we're alive. We're alive only to the extent that the spirit of Christ is being lived in and through us. It's alive to the extent of our fellowship being from God and to one another. Christ's life is in us, you see. It's not in our programming. It's not in our activities. It's not in our meetings. It's, it's not in any of that. It's in us, one to another. Now, also, fellowship requires focus on Jesus. As ironic as it may seem, it was so easy it's so easy, I think, for we Christians to get our attention diverted away from Jesus. We all need to be reminded, as Hebrews 12, 2 says, to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. <coughs> That's how fellowship thrives. It thrives when we are personally seeking Jesus and being filled with Jesus and the overflow of Christ comes one to another. Whatever distractions, friend, are diverting your attention away from Christ, you must turn to him fully by faith and do so remembering that we cannot have fellowship with sin. We cannot have fellowship with anything that is anti-Christ and expect to remain in good fellowship with him and one another. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, don't be mismatched with unbelievers. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship does light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Belial? That's with demons. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? There is no fellowship to be had between the children of light and the children of darkness and no fellowship between sin and being set apart for Christ. Listen to 1 John 1, 6. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's how this works. And let's see also here that fellowship is a group of sinners saved by grace. I just want to reiterate that. That brother or sister across from you in the room, they're just like the old preacher up here. They are sinful. They are redeemed only by the grace of God. I will be the very first to tell you, as I have always told you, if you put your trust in me, you will be let down. 
And if I put my trust in you, sorry, friend, I know I'm going to be let down. Why? Because I'm not Christ, and you're not Christ. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect, but he is. He makes no mistake. He does no wrong. It's in him that we must rest and trust everything. Remember that. You know, sometimes people begin to have their faith molded by what other people do. If you do that, friend, I'll just tell you now, this will save us a bunch of counseling sessions. If you change your faith based upon what a preacher does or what somebody in these pews does, then your faith is in man, not in Christ. Let's keep it in Christ. Paul tells the Philippians, if then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. That's fellowship. And anything less than that falls short of the glory of God. One man described Christians this way to an early Roman emperor. He said they love one another. They never fail to help widows. They save orphans from those who will hurt them. If they have something, they give freely to the man who has nothing. If they see a stranger, they take him home and are happy as though they were a real brother. They don't consider themselves brothers and sisters in the usual sense, but brothers and step in the spirit of God. That's the kind of Christian I want to be. Is that the type of Christian you want to be? If so, we will find it in our Lord Christ. And you will find everything you need today in him as well. Dear friend, I'm talking to you. If you are here and you're looking at your life and you're seeing that there is a huge void in it and you're trying to fill it with everything imaginable on earth, but it's nothing, nothing is working. That void is Christ. He can fill it completely and he will if you will turn from your sin and follow him by faith. And he'll save you today. Dear brother and sister in Christ, do you and I need today to repent of some things in our lives and to seek this type of fellowship that God desires? If that is you, friend, turn to him now. We're going to give you an opportunity to respond as our musicians come and we sing this hymn of invitation. You come when we stand and sing. Father, we pray now your perfect and good will to be done. We ask you, Lord, to lead us in our hearts to foster this fellowship through you.